Story continued from Brontosaurus episode. In the lush forests of the late Jurassic, under the shade of the tall redwood trees, you can find many of the region's smaller dinosaur species, foraging away from the giants of the open plains. Amongst the dense patchwork of ferns is a small flock of Dryosaurus. These small ornithopods live in family groups, with the parents taking care of their young. Hatched in nests, the parents will bring food to the infants for two weeks till they are ready to leave the nest and forage with their parents. This pair of Dryosaurus have 12 young to look after, though they mostly eat the same plants as the adult, so finding food isn't an issue. Protecting them from predators is, however. The forest is filled with small carnivores that could easily make a meal out of their young. Fortunately, the two adults outsize the majority of the forest's small predators. Despite their frail appearance, many of the lightweight carnivores like Stososaurus won't risk the wrath an angry Dryosaurus will unleash in order to protect their children. Still, with so many youngsters to look out for, the parents have to work around the clock to simply keep track of them. The juveniles are growing fast, but at 30 centimeters long, they have a long way to go, and reality will never truly be safe from the area's large carnivorous dinosaurs. Stalking behind the large trees, one of the most elusive predators is eyeing the family group. The long and slender form of an Ornithalestes creeps just out of sight. This female is a night hunting specialist, and though her head and neck seem quite small, her arms allow her to grasp onto struggling prey and either bite at them with her jaws or run while holding a victim securely. In the pale moonlight, her massive eyes can see exceptionally well, but so can the Dryosaurus. If she wants to catch one of the juveniles, it will take a quick yet silent approach in order to seize one in her claws and then retreat into the night before either of the parents can stop her. She has done this many times before, the hardest part was grabbing the little Dryosaurus when they were hidden beneath the ferns. With a general idea of where the juveniles are, the Ornitholestes draws low to the ground and moves forward. Her body cuts through the ferns like a shark swimming across the ocean's surface. Swiftly yet quietly, she shifts through the undergrowth, always keeping the adult Dryosaurus in her peripheral vision, but listening for the sounds of the youngsters. Despite her best efforts, the parents hear the faint sound of the rustling plants and begin to look in her direction. The predator couldn't tell if they had seen her, and in the moment she had to concentrate on the exact location of the hidden juveniles, honing in on the sounds they made while foraging and the slight movement of plants. The Ornithalestes extends both her arms right where one of them should be, and sure enough, her claws hook onto one of their tails. The tiny Dryosaurus squeals in shock and struggles to get away from its attacker, while the Ornithalestes scoops up its prey until its fingers wrap around its body and then presses it against her underside. Now she had to escape. Turning around, all she had to do was sprint far enough that the adults would lose her in the undergrowth. She got three steps before the charging form of the adult female Dryosaurus slammed into her side, sending her into the dirt with a grunt. The juvenile just got out of her grasp, and as the hunter got to her feet, she dodged the female Dryosaurus's follow-up attack and tried to pick up the youngster once again. She had avoided the mother, but the father was heading her way. She had to grab her target quick or she would be trampled. There was a deep, bark-like sound that cut through the air, and just like that, all the small dinosaurs stopped dead in their tracks, as if they had been frozen solid. A few moments passed and almost in unison, both predator and prey dropped to the ground, lying as flat as they could so the surrounding ferns covered their bodies. Seconds pass, and soon the source of the noise and the reason they all hit the dirt came into view. The scarred-faced female Ceratosaurus and her mate moved for the trees searching the area. Their path was not going directly towards the Dryosaurus family, but it was a little too close for their comfort, and the comfort of their attacker. As the large theropods moved patiently through the darkness, sniffing the air and occasionally giving a light bark to each other. The Ornitholestes and the Dryosaurus male were directly in front of each other, and each one fought the urge to attack or even screech at each other. They simply had to wait till the Ceratosaurus moved on. The previously caught juvenile was nowhere to be seen, 
and with two angry parents on either side of her, the Ornithalestes knew that her chance of catching one of the small dinosaurs was all but lost. The Ceratosaurus were not hunting, but patrolling, and just as quickly as they appeared, they disappeared back into the darkness, leaving only silence. The Ornithalestes moved first, getting to her feet and darting through the ferns away from the Drysaurus herd, hungry but uninjured. The family regrouped and counted to make sure they were all still present. They were, though one had some cuts, these would recover. They were all safe, for the moment at least. An hour later, the female Ornitholestes rested under a log and picked apart a lizard she had caught. This would satiate her hunger for now, and besides, there was plenty of food in this forest, and she was plenty skilled enough to catch it. Hello fellow travellers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down the Shadowed Thief of the Morrison Formation, Ornithalestes. Ornithalestes first and only remains were discovered in 1900 in Bone Cabin Quarry, Wyoming. It was described in 1903 by Henry Fairfield Osborne, naming it Ornithalestes hermini, the genus name meaning bird robber, and the species honours the fossil preparator Adam Herman. Though we only have the holotype, it contains the forelimbs, hind limbs, pelvis, parts of the vertebral column, and a crushed skull. It lived in the Kimmeridgean age of the late Jurassic, about 154 million years ago. Ornitholestes is estimated to have grown to between 2 and 2.2 meters long, stood 50 to 60 centimeters high at the hip, and weighed between 12 and 15 kilograms. The skull and neck of Ornitholestes was rather short for a theropod, but the skull is noted for being robustly built, especially the lower jaw. The teeth at the front of the jaws were more conical than the back teeth, with fewer serrations, while the back teeth were more typical of theropods, being recurved with many serrations. The dentary bone is quite large, extending almost to the back of the eye socket, but the teeth do not extend that far, remaining in the front third of the skull. The eye sockets themselves were very large, measuring 25% of the skull's total length, indicating that it had large eyes, likely for a nocturnal lifestyle. On a final note on the skull, you may have seen Ornitholestes depicted with a nasal crest in both literature and television. The fossil did seem to have some form of crest, but this was later dismissed as a misinterpretation. As mentioned earlier, the skull was crushed and the crest turned out to be a turned up skull bone, so nowadays Ornitholestes is not believed to have had a nasal crest. Ornitholestes is described as a short-bodied theropod, and this is seen in its rather compressed looking midsection. The tail however was very long and slender, being slightly longer than the head, neck and body combined. The forelimbs were also long, being almost two-thirds the length of the hind limbs, its upper arms were strongly built, and the lower arms had three long fingers tipped with hook claws, the first two being the largest. A study done in 2006 found that Ornitholestes had a good range of motion in its forearms, though it could not pronate its wrists, it could tuck its arms in close to its body and reach far out in front of itself, and it's likely that Ornitholestes was using its long arms and fingers to grasp onto prey and secure it with its three claws and then if needed, to bite it with its small yet sturdy jaws. But what was it hunting? Henry Fairfield Osborne named it such because he thought it was grabbing birds out of midair. Later studies would put forward that while Ornitholestes could very well have preyed upon early birds, its diet was likely more varied. Feeding on a wide variety of small vertebrates, from lizards, amphibians, mammals, and as shown in the Walking with Dinosaurs documentary, infant dinosaurs. Given its large eyes and small size compared to other Morrison Formation predators like Ceratosaurus and Allosaurus, Ornitholestes was likely a nocturnal hunter, filling a niche similar to modern small cats. An opportunistic hunter that would grab small prey in its claws and start eating, even if its victim was still alive. In 1969, John H. Ostrom, noted that the claw on the second digit of the hind limb, aka the innermost toe, was larger than those of the third and fourth digits, and suggested that this digit 
may have been an early form of the sickle claw seen on dromaeosaurs. However, due to the incomplete nature of the second digit, this theory is impossible to confirm without more specimens. So where on the dinosaur family tree does Ornithalestes belong? Good question, as Ornithalestes seems to be a strange piece of the theropod puzzle. In 1988, it was thought to be closely related to Proceratosaurus from England. However, it was later found that Proceratosaurus was an early Tyrannosaur, so that connection was unattainable. Today, it is seen as the earliest known member of the Manoraptora group, and closely related to Comsegnathids. Some of the species found at the same quarry Ornithalestes was found include Stegosaurus, Allosaurus, Apatosaurus, and Gargulliosaurus. Living amongst these giants, Ornithalestes likely competed with other carnivores of similar size, such as Stoxosaurus and Cielorus, and each may have been specialized in slightly different prey, or hunted in different biomes, or are different parts of the day and night. So. Ornithalestes, doom of all sauropodlets. And a great example of how the Morrison wasn't just full of giant sized dinosaurs. But what do you think of Ornithalestes? And for my question of the week, do you see Ornithalestes as a generalist or a specialist? And if so, what did it specialize in? Let me know what lesser known dinosaur you'd like me to do a breakdown on next. And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.